2008. It was a cold and sunny morning in the snow-covered city of Sofia in Bulgaria. Paul and his family had just returned after a skiing trip, and the next day, Paul would have to go back to work in the large chocolate factory where Paul managed over a 1,000 people. That Sunday morning, however, he was just chilling in his boxer shorts on the couch in the living room. His son was playing in front of his feet, and his very pregnant wife, Ariane, was in the shower. All of a sudden, Paul felt that something was terribly wrong. He was only able to shout one final sentence. Ariana, you have to come now. Before he dropped to the floor where she would find him one minute later. <laughs> when Paul woke up a few weeks later in a hospital back in the Netherlands. He could neither move nor speak. He could only blink with his eyes. And they quickly found a way to communicate with him. They said, if you look up, it means yes. If you look down, it means no. Thank you for the nice demonstration, Paul. <laughs> the doctors told him he had suffered from a stroke and that he had a medical condition called the locked-in syndrome. They were very pessimistic about his ability to recover, and some even suggested that maybe life would not be worth living. They asked his wife, rather than Paul, if he wanted to die. But Paul wanted to live, to be a father, to see his children grow up. And more than anything, he wanted to be given a chance to rehabilitate as best as he could. The Dutch healthcare system did not offer him this chance. The doctors thought the benefits would be too small, and frankly, the rehabilitation centers were not able to host a, ca a case such as severe as Paul. With the help of private money and many, many friends, you were able to stretch your rehabilitation period to almost <laughs> five... <laughs> You were able to stretch your rehabilitation period to almost five years in a private clinic in Germany. You learned how to swallow again, to hold up and move your head, and you learned how to move your thumb. <laughs> Voila. I met Paul six years later. I am, when he entered one of my studies as a research participant, I am a psychologist and a neuroscientist, and I've spent over 17 years trying to unlock people with locked-in syndrome. I did that by developing brain-computer interfaces. This technology is a fascinating result from neuroscience. You can willfully have a thought, and this thought is trans is Re resulting in some brain patterns being changed. I can decode these brain patterns and translate them through very fancy algorithms into commands for computers or a wheelchair or a communication device. I have won awards for my research and obtained prestigious funding. <laughs> and all those years, I believed that brain-computer interface technology would be the way to unlock people with locked-in syndrome. But little did I know that Paul would be one of the reasons why I would stop developing brain-computer interfaces and in start, instead start taking social action. Neither did Paul know, nor I, that we would do that together today. During the last study, Paul and I became friends, and currently we're even colleagues. We make funny theater lectures together about disruptive life events, such as a stroke or a divorce. <laughs> such as a stroke or a divorce, or Christmas with your family-in-law. <laughs> and we became friends because we share the same sense of humor. And I warn you, we didn't bring our velvet gloves today. <laughs> We 
communicate through Paul's eyes and through assistive technology. When he looks up, he says yes. When he looks down, he says no. Come to think about it, you're somewhat like a living doll on stage, aren't you? No. <laughs> oh. Do you want to kick my ass for calling you a living doll? Yes? <laughs> yeah, try. <laughs> In the last study I conducted with Paul and other people with locked-in syndrome, I did not test any brain-computer interface. Instead, I took a step back and I asked, mm, do you think you even need a brain-computer interface? Do you feel included in society? Do you feel that you belong? Before I reveal the results of that study, let me quickly summarize what we know about locked-in syndrome. It is a rare condition. It's also an umbrella term for all physical condition in which somebody is completely paralyzed, but has a completely intact mind. So you cannot move your body, but you're sharp as ever. If we look at the Netherlands with a population of 17 million, we estimate that there are 130 people with locked-in syndrome. And contrary to what many healthy people think, that people with locked-in syndrome have a good quality of life. They think their life is worth living. <laughs> now, this is so counterintuitive, mostly to the audience, that we always ask the audience to grade their own quality of life. So I'm going to invite you. Think back of the last two months of your life. You ha would have to grade your life from 1 to 10, 10 being the best. What grade would you give your own quality of life at the moment? Who thinks they would give themselves a sufficient, at least? Raise your hand, please. Who thinks I have a 6? Who thinks I have a 7? Who thinks I have an 8? Who thinks I have a 9? Who thinks, who has a 10? Oh, we have a couple of 10s in the room, it's so nice. Should we ask Paul as well this question? Yeah. Are you ready? With you, I start with one. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight at the moment. So it's very comparable to yours, this quality of life. Now, why is Paul's quality of life so high? After Paul accepted that he could not further rehabilitate, he reinvented himself as a husband, as a father, as a man in a wheelchair who cannot speak. He wrote a book together with a journalist and his wife. He started a company. He goes to Formula One races whenever he can. can. And he drinks pina colada and swims with dolphins in Curaçao. And a couple of minutes ago, he became the first TED speaker who cannot speak. <laughs> okay, I'm the scientist. Paul's story isn't even exceptional. It's the rule. Almost all the people I spoke to were able to reinvent themselves after a locked-in syndrome, given some time, of course. They even could communicate again through assistive technology. But the thing they couldn't get used to, the thing that bothered them, that frustrated them, that made them very angry, was to be overlooked, to not be seen for who you truly are, to be underestimated. The people I spoke to said progress more than the doctors predicted. They wanted to train harder than the physiotherapist thought was right for them. And they enjoyed life more than outsiders would think. A man said to me, I have a communication device, but people turn their back at me. Another man said, people react so spastic when they see me. And one woman said, 
brain-computer interfaces are nice and all, but when are you going to change something about society? Now, that final remark made me quit developing brain-computer interfaces. Instead, I now perform with Paul. We make theater lectures together. A speaker who cannot speak and a runaway scientist. What a pair we make. <laughs> and we... <coughs> By now, we understand that our audience normally needs a minute or so to adjust to the situation. What did you think when you first saw Paul? Did you think maybe, is he really in there? Can he hear me? Why, is, why are his legs flapping up and down the whole time? It can be a bit uncomfortable having us on stage. And we've even come to enjoy a little bit the confusion in your face when we see that you slowly start to understand that he is just like you. Working together with Paul also has many advantages, let's be honest. We always park in the handicap space right next to the building. <laughs> and we know the audience claps for us because if you don't clap for Paul, you will go to hell. <laughs> Paul has also made me realize what kind of man I should be dating. Think about it. He's clever. He's handsome. He cannot walk away. <laughs> nor interrupt me when I'm talking. He's the ideal man. <laughs> but really, Paul also thinks I'm the ideal woman. I'm talented, sexy, intelligent, very funny. He considers leaving his wife for me. <laughs> He's saying. <laughs> Let's come back to our original question. How can we unlock people with locked-in syndrome? Of course, we need innovative technology, but we need societal change much more. It is us, the healthy people, who have the problem. We are so uncomfortable with the sight of people with a disability, people whose bodies are different than ours. We have too many wrong assumptions about people in a wheelchair. And why is that? I think it's because we don't see a lot of people with a wheelchair or with a disability in our society. Society is made for the fit and the able. Many people testified, I can't get in can't get into the rehabilitation center because I require too much care, can't get into the restaurant because the... can't get into the restaurant because the owner did not build a ramp. Paul and I want to ask all of you one question. All hundred of you here and all the people viewing. Tomorrow, when you go to your favorite place, Demand that it becomes accessible for people like Paul. Whether it is... <laughs> whether it is your workplace, or your favorite nightclub, or your TV show, or the streets you walk on, demand that they become accessible. And it's not only for Paul, but for 15% of the world population who has a disability. Paul is living proof that life can be worth living with the locked-in syndrome. It's really not really a locked-in syndrome, but a locked-out syndrome. We need to start seeing people for who they truly are. And seeing someone is not something you do with your eyes. It's something you do with your heart. <laughs>